This is the sound of lunchtime in Jakarta and in any time of day in Bangkok. Over 80% of households in Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia own at least one motorcycle. As a result, these country cities are some of the most polluted in the world. While Jakarta and Hanoi lead the pollution charts in Southeast Asia, it has been reported that in Manila, between 11,000 and 27,000 deaths have been linked to air pollution in 2018 alone. It's therefore not a surprise that sustainability has grabbed consumer attention. And as a result, electric vehicles have become an enticing economic opportunity for both private businesses and governments. The adoption of electric vehicles is a win-win for everyone involved. However, the electric vehicle revolution will not happen overnight, or even over a year or two. Ultimately, the question of the electrification of mobility is not about if, but rather how Southeast Asia can shift to electric vehicle adoption, and who will lead to the necessary changes that are required in order to do so. All socioeconomic classes suffer from the side effects of declining air quality, pushing governments and private companies to find new solutions. What separates Southeast Asia from the rest of the world is the population's dependency on two-wheel vehicles as opposed to cars. 120 million uh, motorcycle users in Indonesia. Even car owners, they have motorbikes at home and they don't use their car often because you don't have to travel very far for everything and the road is narrow. Southeast Asia is home to many motorized two-wheelers, like motorcycles, scooters, and tuk-tuks, which are used for daily commuting needs. Electric vehicles are estimated to constitute around 2% of the Vietnamese market. Since 2019, the electric vehicle market in Vietnam is growing around 30% year by year. It is huge potential for the future. We believe that uh, this market will, will grow even faster. Amongst Southeast Asian countries, Indonesia, the largest economy in the region, possesses the largest nickel, an important component of lithium-ion battery, at a whopping 25% of total nickel on Earth, and is poised to become a leader in the electric vehicle value chain. Moreover, the government's goal is to have at least 13 million two-wheeled EVs roaming the streets by 2030. Not only that, by 2050, all sales of vehicles with internal combustion engines might cease to exist. And while it might seem far-fetched at the moment, Indonesia's lawmakers have already made steps toward successful implementation of those goals. First, the government has actively invested in subsidies to encourage the population to switch to electric vehicles. There have also been tax holiday incentives for electric vehicle manufacturers, reduction of import duties on unassembled and semi-assembled vehicles, and import tariff deductions for materials and machinery utilized in EV production. The central government has the roadmap, but again, it's up to the regional government to follow up or to adapt this roadmap into their own region. Like for example, Jakarta has their own regulation uh, concerning tax and also West Java. But governments are not alone. Pioneering companies such as Mercedes and Hyundai have already opened EV production lines within the region. However, at this point in time, affordability, appropriate infrastructure, and performance within cities remain barriers for growth. It's really difficult for Indonesia to switch that fast. Like they have to see it first, they have to try it first. You can purchase a normal motorbike at just a few hundred. USD. It's the cost, it's kind of like a huge concern for Indonesia because it's quite expensive for most people. Recent turbulent war times proved to have a big impact on many city dwellers in Southeast Asia as fuel and gas prices skyrocketed in a matter of weeks. Yet the initial cost of purchasing an electric vehicle is still a strong deterrent for many consumers. According to research we conducted, 47% of Indonesian and 52% of Vietnamese consumers cited price as an issue with EVs. While it's true that electric motorbike uh, on average is more expensive than gasoline equivalent, it's much cheaper in usage. It's because of the much lower maintenance cost and also because of the gasoline price versus electricity per kilometer driven. We calculated in that bike that the difference between the price of uh, Weaver 200 and gasoline equivalent uh, of uh, our motorbike will get to basically zero after two years of uh, usage of uh, Weaver 200. But even with enhanced financing options at their disposal, at the end of the day, 
transportation within a city comes down to efficiency for the end consumer. And the perception of EV performance lacks the trust for a sweeping change in consumer behaviors in the short term. But it's just perception because with the current innovations, the gap is really decreasing. The power of the Weaver 200 is 6,000 watts, equal to whatever the average 125cc bikes uh, has. Then the range of Weaver 200 is 200 kilometers. So in many cases, it's even more than the average uh, gasoline motorbike. And the charging time is uh, one hour to 100 kilometers and three hours to 200 kilometers. But with all that said, the main barrier standing in the way of electric vehicles in Southeast Asian cities is the current infrastructure at their disposal. For example, 57% of Vietnamese who participated in our research cited lack of recharging stations as a key barrier for purchasing an EV. At the moment, we're developing a lot of charging stations, not only in Jakarta, but all over Indonesia. If it's all over Indonesia, you need to build the electricity infrastructure first before building the charging station. While some governments are piloting charging stations in central areas to deduce usage patterns as a basis for efficient rollout plans in the near future, Others are partnering with companies to create battery swapping stations, which could ensure a peace of mind for many consumers who rely on their two-wheeled vehicles for work. That said, interoperability frictions remain a concern when it comes to different EV models, battery technology, and zone-specific dominance within cities. We should work together to have the network similar to gasoline bikes, so it's gonna increase the convenience for the customers. We also should probably have the similar or the same charging ports in our bike, so any charging station can be used by any uh, bike on the market. It seems that the rise of two-wheeled EVs as the preferred means of transportation is not far. For a true reform, now more than ever, Coexistence and collaboration is the way forward.